Uh, I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> so um, your history with the Patriots, um, defensive coordinator, been there a long time. Really, I, I've leaned on you for years. Um, you know, going in to the New England-Kansas City, I love New England against the Chargers. Had to go 3,000 miles again. I just thought there was going to be a little bit of an urgency Patriots rest that I love Kansas City this weekend. And you didn't. You like New England going in. Why? Well, he, here's here's the conflict I had internally. Is, is If you look at it, the shifts, the motions, the multiple personnel groups playing on the road, a mobile quarterback, everything said that Kansas City should win. And and I, I thought that objectively, but after experiencing what I experienced in New England and understanding that process and the people that were involved, if I had to put money on the game, I, w- I would have put money on New England. And and you saw it play out in the first half where Patrick Mahomes, you've got a single coverage with a rookie cornerback on Travis Kelsey, and, and Mahomes really doesn't go to him very much. Yeah. you know, And, and missing things like that or the way that New England took a took advantage of the deep setting by the offensive tackles that Kansas City does to bring their ends up the field and then underneath and then wrap their tackles around to keep them in the pocket. Those types of things Kansas City didn't figure out in the first half, and they get shut out. Now, later on in the game, they started to figure some of those things out, but it's that that edge of experience and and their ability to do things that take away strengths and and, and exploit weaknesses that gives them a shot against anybody, regardless of what the talent level is. By the way, speaking of talent level, um, you've coached in this league twice. Um, you know, it, there's a real roll of the dice, what the Rams did. Uh, Aqib Tlaib, Marcus Peters, and Dominican Sue, Dante Fowler. Dante Fowler was an underachiever. Sue's been an underachiever. Tlaib's good when he's winning. Uh, Marcus Peters is a pain in the butt, even his college coach. Andy Reid moved off him. What do you make of it now that it got to the Super Bowl? Can the Rams pump their chest and go, we were right? Look, whenever you whenever you go down this this road, it's great as long as you're winning. It's fantastic as long as you're winning. It's when you hit those patches of adversity that they, those guys that have questionable pass become a real problem. And I experienced it in Cleveland in 95. We're projected to go to the Super Bowl. We, you know, the team announces that, it gets, that it's, uh, they're moving. We hit adversity. And there were guys there that, that kind of similar makeup. And when all that happened, everybody was looking for a life raft. And you saw it to some degree late in the season with the Rams where the defense regressed, and the, those are the guys making business decisions. I'm not going to get hurt before the playoffs. I, you know, the, I'm going sure. to go into a little bit of cruise control. Now, that being said, this is where guys like that have real value. It's easy to coach in the playoffs. It's really easy to coach in the Super Bowl because everybody's dialed in. Everybody's going to be the best form of themselves. Nobody wants to be the guy that loses the game. Everybody wants to be the guy that makes play. It's, it's perfect now. Is it a model that that's sustainable? Yeah, if you can win like the Rams did, yeah, it'll be great. You hit a patch of adversity, good luck. Talk about Super Bowl prep. Uh, you've prepped for Super Bowls before. Um, New England has a decided advantage in experience here. Super Bowl prep advantage New England, right? Yeah, they, they've played in nine Super Bowls and ten Thursday night games. So this is no different for them than getting... You you know getting ready for a, a a schedule like a Thursday night game it's it's just another part of their process and, and going to the first Super Bowl was tough you you've got pressure from family and friends and the media a change in 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 the environment all these things are pulling at you and if you don't know how to handle that and navigate through that you're you're at a pretty big disadvantage even how do you use this week. Versus the second week. How do you make sure that the guys don't get too high too early? How do you deal with the extended pregame? How do you deal with the extended halftime? All those things for New England, it's just another It's just another way, part of the it, process. It's keeping players dialed in for two weeks. Uh, Belichick, obviously, they added eight new plays in the hotel lobby the morning of the game over Kansas City. Would Belichick keep some stuff, some tricks to keep players focused and driven? Don't you lay out the game plan by f- Saturday morning? Well, yeah, you, you're gonna you're gonna go through this week, and the the bulk of the plan is in this week when you're home, when you're working in, in your in your tra- traditional format. Now that being said, you have time to watch more tape. You you find some other things. So during that second week, you're gonna keep introducing those things to the guys. And 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 if you find something Sunday morning, 
or Sunday before the game, and you've got an experienced group, you're going to go to them and say, look, I think we got a shot to hit this. Let, let's go with it. Just like you saw last weekend, where when you've got a young group or a group that's not used to adjusting or a group that's not used to dealing with the level of anxiety and pressure that goes into a Super Bowl, you put those plays in, it could be an absolute you know, disaster. disaster. Yeah, I mean, Rams' first hour were, were bailing water. Patriots' first hour were in total control. They both faced the same harsh road environment. Okay, end of the Rams' Saints. Controversy, blown call, no call. Blame the refs. Let's sue the NFL. What'd you make of that mess in New Orleans? Well, well look, I've heard that there would have been about 30 seconds left in the game if they were able to yeah. run the ball three times after the pass interference call or, or no call. In the first game, the Rams scored at the end of the half with 26 seconds left. So there's no guarantee that, that the Rams couldn't have gotten the ball and gone down and kicked a field goal. Okay, that being said, there was a ton of football that took place after that moment. They, they had a chance to stop them. Then they got the ball in overtime. They got a questionable pass interference call in their favor. The, the Saints did in overtime. And then the, the Rams still had to go down and kick a 57-yard field goal to, to win the game. So my question is, was it so caught up in that moment, so caught up in the no call that it cost them the game after that? Human error is part of, of, of football. That, that, that happens. And where you stand on those calls depend on where you sit. I think the tuck rule was a great call in New England, but I was in New England at the time. It's just, now, and we had to do things to win the game there yeah. after that Yeah, call. people forget the tuck rule. There was a lot after that. There was, yeah, the, look, the human error is part of the game, and it's not like the game ended at that moment. And it's not like the Saints didn't have an opportunity to win after that, that moment. And they got the ball first in overtime, just like New England did. They could have walked down the field and scored a touchdown, but they didn't. Um, you know, overtime rules, one of the things about overtime I like in the NFL that I don't like in college is the NFL doesn't have this mythology you know, they're not paralyzed by it. NFL's like, yeah, you can both have the ball as long as you can make a stop. And then you get the ball, too. And by the way, most of the time that happens. College football, they give both teams the ball. They put them in field goal range. And then if you both score and we bring it out, and it, they're, they're afraid to not be fair. But in college football, the games end up being 62 to 60, and the least exhausted team wins. The NFL in college football, overtime toss winner, NFL actually is more fair than college football statistically. The overtime's never bothered me in the NFL. I think some of it is that we like Mahomes. He's fresh, he's new, he's fun. And he didn't get the ball in overtime, and it ticks us off, and we <laughs> hate the Patriots. I, the overtime rule doesn't bother me. Does it bother you? It, it, it doesn't bother me. I think it's more fair than, than it has been. I wouldn't mind, though, each team getting possession. So, so New England goes down, they, and they score a touchdown, and then Kansas City gets a chance to, to score as well. Like, give each one a possession outside of just the field goal versus touchdown way that it's set up now, I don't think there'd be any problem with that. I know that player safety is an issue. Yes. And they don't want to extend the game. So maybe during the regular season, you leave it as is. And in the postseason, each team gets one chance, regardless of whether you score a touchdown on the first drive or not. But the concern by the NFL is the longer a game goes, the injuries increase. So as you go to overtime, it's like skiing. You're, they always say your last run of the day skiing, go slow. That's when you break your knee. In football, as the game goes to overtime, statistically, the injuries increase. So if Kansas City did take the ball and soared all the way down, now we got a real quarter going on. Well, but, but look, the difference in, in playoff football versus regular season football is you're going to keep going in overtime until there's a winner. There, there are no ties. So that's what I'm saying. If you kept it the same during the regular season but gave each team at least one possession in the postseason, then I think you could, you could find a compromise between – player safety and someone saying we didn't have an opportunity that we should have had. Finally, Eric Mangini, former NFL head coach, couple of places, defensive coordinator with the Patriots. I, I said this a couple days ago is that, you know, we've got all these new quarterbacks. We got Mahomes and we got Deshaun Watson and we got, you know, Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold. The one kid that does remind me of Brady, right? Because we're always comparing who's the next Michael, who's the next LeBron, right? We're always comparing. Jared Goff reminds me a lot of Brady. He's tall and gawky when he came in. California kid, really stable family, incredibly coachable, kind of quiet and demure, handsome kid, but you don't see him in the weather. You don't see him in the news. Um, and I, you know, I kind of look at them and I'm like, precise passers, pocket throwers, move well within the pocket, but you don't want them running. I see 
some Brady in golf. Yeah, it's, you were it, and you were with Brady early. I, I I was with Brady early, and I've told this story a bunch of times. Tom Brady was not Tom Brady when he first came <laughs> out, and and that first season that he was there post practice, we'd always have these one on ones. I had the DBs. Brad Seeley would be out there. He was the special teams coach at the time, and we'd bet a dollar on each one of the reps. And I won a ton of dollars because Tom would throw the ball in the dirt, or he'd miss a guy wide. So so he was able to to grow because he had traits, and he had tremendous traits. And that work ethic, the thing I don't know about golf is, is does he have that same type of work ethic? And the other thing that's, that's difficult to predict is with fame, with money, with success, with, with uh, consistent success, how much do you change? So Tom, yeah, he's got a, a different haircut and he looks a little bit more fashionable than he did back in the day, <laughs> but he's still the same person. He still works the same way every day. And to me, that's, that's unique. The other thing about Tom is there's an unselfishness in his play. He doesn't need to have giant statistics. He doesn't need to feed the ball to Gronkowski. He's going to throw to the open receiver. And that takes a lot of discipline. A ton. And it takes a, a, an absence of ego where you're not worried if you run the ball 40 times and your numbers look horrible. He just wants to win. So it's it's hard to predict how anybody's going to deal with extended success like Tom has. Yeah. Also, another thing is the Patriots have had incredible continuity among their staff, whereas as the kind of hot franchise, the Rams are already getting their staff poached by everybody in the league, where the Patriots have Dante Scarnecchia, 